here. There we go. So guys, the date today, May 2nd, the topic for your notes today, you'll find conveniently located at the top of the screen. And guys, again, right in the middle of the screen. And guys, again, today is, th this unit is short. Two days of new material. I think you'll find uh, this stuff sort of interesting. But guys, we should ask the question, how did you and Miss Call choose to do this? Why is it so small? How does it fit in? And guys, here's the answer. Um, frankly, we used to spend a lot more time talking about gases. And you're going to find out this entire unit is about gases. We used to spend three and a half weeks on this. Here's what we found. Number one, this stuff is not on the SAGE test. And so back in the day when we used to care about SAGE, what we did is we took this material and put it at the end of the year because we knew it wasn't on the SAGE test. Guys, the other thing that we chose to do was to squish this down. And here's why. Guys, this is your, well, you'll, you won't see, but just trust me on this. This is the most difficult thing that we could teach all year. Guys, my AP students struggle with gas chemistry like there's no tomorrow. We're studying right now for the AP test, and a large percentage of the questions that they're coming to me and going, I still don't understand this, is all about gases. And we used to, in general chem, we used to get into the crazy, confusing stuff about gases. And um, what we found was it was so beyond what we needed to do in general chemistry that Ms. Call and I said, let's do this. Let's make the unit small. Let's make it practical. Let's make it interesting. Let's use it as a way to wrap up the year. Let's make it easier. And then let's save the hard stuff for AP. So guys, what you're going to see is this unit is as interesting as chemistry can get, and it's going to be wildly practical. Um, and you're going to see that the questions on the test, the questions on the final are hopefully practical. Um, but you're going to find this to be a, a relatively interesting unit. So guys, let's get started. I'm going to lead you towards the things that you need to be thinking about and writing down. But guys, here's where we're going to start. Um, as I was handing out papers to everybody a minute ago, I glanced down at Brighton's notebook. You don't have it there, do you? I know. It would, I should have, I should have, pro oh my gosh, guys, look what's in here. Can I just pull it? Guys, remember this stuff? The kinder, gentler days of chemistry when we talked about gangster guns and how to light Bunsen burners? Yeah, that was like in September, like late August. But it feels like yesterday and yet a lifetime ago. Well, guys, sorry, I ruined that for you. But guys, I bring that up simply because I'm wondering if you remember this. Yeah, I remember TOSOC and TOSVOC. And, and, and all of this stuff about solids and liquids and gases, and we, we boiled water and we froze wax. What was up with that? And guys, this, 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 was, this, was, this was right in the middle of what we were doing like four months ago. Well, guys, this is also the tie to what we're doing today. Because, guys, what we're going to do for the next couple days is we are going to talk in greater detail about gases. So, guys, as we get started, here's what I need you to do. You need to be developing a mental model. So if you can imagine, I hate it when teachers tell you to close your eyes. I know it feels weird, but if you want to. Guys, it, it can, so when we talk about gases, we said that solids are organized and all packed together. We showed examples of stuff like this. And guys, what are these particles doing? They're sitting there and vibrating, right? This is good stuff for the final, by the way. Guys, they're sitting there and vibrating. Can we make them vibrate faster? Yeah, how? Heat them up. And eventually they vibrate so fast that what do they do? They melt and the structure collapses. And when the structure collapses, salt does not magically turn into water, but it does turn into a liquid. And then guys, what are these things doing? Do you remember our analogy? Mosh pit. It is full on violent inside of liquids and they're running into each other at hundreds of miles an hour and it's an absolute mess inside there. But what holds these things together? Intermolecular forces. And so guys, eventually these things start moving fast enough that the intermolecular forces break and they jump out as a gas. And then guys, we end up with a gas that looks like that, right? Is that all coming back to you? Now here's the question. Guys, the problem is this. 
we've got pictures of solids, liquids, and gases. But to really understand them, we don't need pictures, we need videos. We need motion. And again, what are these things doing? How are they moving, reviewing for the final? They're wiggling. How are these things moving, reviewing for the final? Mosh pit. But guys, how are those things moving, reviewing for the final? And what are they doing? Straight lines until what happens? They hit the wall or each other. Now guys, we talked about that before. We said they travel randomly, their positions are, are random, that they travel in straight lines till they run into something. But guys, we never really showed you what that looks like. And so guys, a couple years ago, I got all ambitious and I tried to build a gas simulation device. And I failed miserably. But I did find an example of it. It was actually some chemistry teacher posted this and I tried to build one and it didn't go very well. But guys, what I want to offer to you is a moving picture, if you will, of what's going on inside of gases. So guys, as you're developing this mental model, this is actually what it looks like inside of a gas. It's funny because the first time I saw this, I thought this thing was huge. And I, I started, I, was, I you know, I saw it, I want to build one of those. And the guy had the instructions. And I started thinking, okay, so I'm going to need some wood and a big old piece. Turns out this thing's about that big. Yeah, yeah, he's just way zoomed into it. I mean, you can picture, like, these are little thumb screws, right, to give you a sense of scale. So this thumb screw is actually about that far across. He's just way zoomed into it. But guys, this is actually a very good representation of what's going on inside of gases. Understand that there actually isn't a plunger that keeps the molecules moving. By the way, what keeps them moving? Heat. Right? Yeah, so guys, the heat from the room keeps these molecules moving. And guys, these things are slamming into each other. He actually put two different types of gases in here. One big molecule, one small molecule. Don't worry about that. We talk about that a lot in AP, because you can actually calculate the speeds of these molecules based on their size. We're going to do that next year. But guys, this is actually a really good model of what it looks like inside of gases. So, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to hit pause. Because what I want you to do is I want you right now, and it doesn't matter which one you pick, but I want you to pick a molecule, just one, a ball, a molecule. Pick a molecule inside this sample. Did you all pick one? You got it? Okay. Keep your eye on it. You got it? Okay, so do this. Now pick a molecule, okay, and then predict where it's going to be in two seconds. Just make a guess. Where is it going to be in two seconds? Ready? Here we go. How many of you were right? Okay. So, guys, there's obviously a point to this. Here's the point, and this is why this is such a wonderful demonstration. Guys, what you are looking at right here in this video has a name. This is what is called a chaotic system. And guys, chaotic does not mean all messed up. Chaotic is actually a mathematical term. And guys, the term chaotic simply means cannot be described with an equation. It's not a word you need to know. But guys, you got to understand, these gas samples really are chaotic. There is no way to predict where the molecules are. There are no way to predict where they came from. And there's no way to predict where they're going. And so guys, what we need to do is we need to wrap our arms around the idea. And this is why this is so hard in AP. Guys, these gas systems are crazy complicated in ways that these aren't. Ready? Let's play the game again. You see this molecule? Still there? How about now? They don't move. And guys, liquids, yeah, they're a little more chaotic, but we can still get a general sense of where the molecules are at. Guys, you cannot do that in a gas. 
is these gases are chaotic systems. But this brings up a problem because, guys, we need to be able to study gases. But gases don't lend themselves well to study because they're so chaotic. So, guys, you ready for a general principle in science? What do scientists do? And this is where you're going to start taking notes. Guys, what do scientists do when they're trying to describe a system that is so complicated it's hard to describe? Here's what we do. Guys, we use models. We use oversimplified models, and these oversimplified models allow us to study systems that we couldn't otherwise. So guys, in your notes, you want to write this down. These are what are called ideal gases. Do not write down the next sentence except for a couple words, and I will guide you. So guys, this is the idea. Because gases are chaotic, guys, just write down the second, third, and fourth words. Gases are chaotic. They cannot be described with simple mathematical formulas. Don't write down anything else. Just know the gases are, are, are chaotic. So guys, so what? Well, the idea is this. Because they're chaotic, their behaviors are hard to describe using simple mathematical equations. So we got two choices. We can either give up or we can find another way to approach the problem. So guys, here's what we do. And this is the rest of the stuff you need to write down. So guys, in order to address this chaos, we use a simplified model for gases. So guys, here is how you pick a good model. One, the model needs to allow for simplified math, or math at all. You guys want to know another chaotic system that we experience a lot? Our weather. Yeah, you guys know that the most powerful computers on the planet right now are dedicated to predicting the weather? And you all understand that outside of three days, it's a crapshoot, right? When you see the 10-day weather forecast, that is a joke. They have no idea. Guys, their accuracy rates fall almost to zero after four days because our weather systems are so chaotic. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, there, I, yeah. So all of this is encapsulated in something called chaos theory. Um, it's a fascinating realm in science and math. I actually did some research in this when I was in college. Yeah, and this is all about chaos theory. There are some beautiful books about this. Yeah, go ahead. That's exactly what we're talking about. Do you want to explain it? Yeah, and actually the people that were writing the original chaos theory books in the late 80s, that was their analogy, was that the wings of a butterfly in Central America can cause a hurricane in the United States. Um, that, and the, so they call it the butterfly theory. Um, but the, the thought behind it, and this is why our weather systems are so chaotic, is because there are so many different variables. When a butterfly does this, they move the air, and that same air becomes our weather. And because there are so many variables, we can't control the variables, so we can't make predictions. The same thing is true of those gases. We can't control all the variables, so we can't make predictions. So if you start to look into this, Garrett, the term for that is actually what is called sensitivity to initial conditions. Um, so that's one of the theories in chaos theory, is if we could accurately measure the initial conditions, we could make predictions. But because we can't keep track of butterflies, we're stuck. So guys, one thing that these things need to do is they need to simplify the math. But here's the other thing. They also have to provide accurate answers. It doesn't do any good to have a, syst uh, have a model that is simple but not accurate. So guys, our models have got to be simple and accurate. So here's how we do it. Guys, this is the working model that we're going to use for gases throughout the year. And I know this is starting to feel like a, not, a lot of notes. It's not going to be. It's just really front loaded. So guys, this then is our simplified model. This is called the ideal gas. Ooh. 
Those are the guiding thoughts that you need to have in your mind. So guys, we are for the rest of the, for the rest of, for even in AP next year, we are going to treat gases as if they behave according to the ideal gas model. Now guys, the first thing that you've got to understand is they don't exist. There is no such thing as an ideal gas. This is a simplified model. Why do we use it? Because it makes math easier. But they don't really exist. We pretend like they do, but they really don't. So guys, what are the simplifications in the ideal gas model? Well guys, simplification, there are two. We say this, ideal gases are gases composed of molecules with dot, dot, dot. Two simplifications. Simplification number one, they have mass but no volume. And this is a great opportunity to review for the final. So guys, ideal gases, which don't really exist, have molecules with mass but no volume. Now guys, what does that mean that they have mass? What is mass? They comp they're composed of something. But guys, what does it mean that they have no volume? They don't take up space. So guys, fundamentally what this means is this. The molecules exist, but they don't take up space. Is that possible? No. If you exist, you have to take up space. But guys, our simpler model for gases supposes that they don't. So the molecules are there, but they don't take up space. So the analogy might go like this. If you take water and boil it, as the water molecules turn into steam, they disappear. They're still there, but they don't take up any space. We'll talk more in a minute. And then guys, the last, the second, but the last oversimplification is this. They have no intermolecular forces. So what does that mean? Well, it means that they never stick to each other. So guys, once you're done with this, I know this is weird. Let me explain to you these oversimplifications, and then we're going to play with this a little bit, and then this is going to get really practical. You guys okay? You caught up? Okay, so here's the idea. So here we've got a beaker of liquid water, and we're going to turn this into steam. But then, here, let me do this up here. But then, guys, imagine that we were to put a balloon on top of this, and we're going to fill the balloon with steam. Can you picture it? Okay, so here's the idea. And the, the balloon is there, but I've got to be able to reach inside to put these in motion. So we've got these water molecules, and they're stuck together. And then we add energy to them, and they move faster and faster and faster. And then they boil, and they jump up into the air as steam. So now, guys, they're inside the balloon. If you can imagine the balloon that's here, and these things are moving around. Now, here's what happens to these molecules when they turn into steam. First of all, they disappear. They no longer take up space, but they still fill the balloon. So guys, how can these molecules fill the balloon if the molecules don't take up space? And the answer is because they're moving. They're still there, and they're moving. And as they move, they push out on the balloon, and they make the balloon inflate. So they don't take up. They're, 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 in, they're invisible, if you will. But they're moving around and pushing out on the balloon. So that's the first oversimplification. Mass, but no volume. So when they become a gas, they disappear. They're still there, but they're moving around so quickly, and that's what fills the balloon. The second oversimplification is this. Guys, what happens to these if they run into each other? They stick, right? But guys, here's what we say in an ideal gas. Even when these things run into each other, they never stick. So they hit and bounce without sticking at all. Those are the two simplifications for an ideal gas. One, they exist, but they don't take up space, but they can still fill a balloon because they're moving. And two, they never stick to each other. You guys okay? Questions on that? 
So guys, now for the rest of this unit, for the rest of the year, we are going to behave as if all gases are ideal. So fundamentally what we're saying is we're gonna picture these molecules as, as, as being there but not taking up space, never sticking to each other. You're going, wait, why does that matter? We'll talk more next week, but for now we're just gonna take it as true. You guys okay? Okay, so guys, moving along then, this is the next thing we need to get in our notes. And this is where this is going to become much, much more practical. STP, scratch it down. So guys, and, but you don't need to write down this sentence. So here's the trick. As we now start to study gases, guys, we've got to control the factors that, that change the way gases behave. And I think you guys know this, right? If I have a balloon and I heat it up, what happens to the size of the balloon? It gets bigger, right? Heat gases up and they expand. So guys, we need to control these factors that change the behavior of gases. And those factors are temperature and pressure. So now you need to start writing this down. Guys, this leads us to standard temperature and pressure. You guys remember when we talked about standard temperature and pressure? Really briefly when we talked about the mole and we said the volume of a mole of gas is 22.4 liters at standard temperature and pressure. Well, now we're going to define it. So guys, you need to know these definitions. So temperature and pressure change the way gases behave. So we need standards. So guys, first of all, standard temperature. So standard temperature is defined as zero degrees Celsius or 273 Kelvin. That's a number you need to know. Although actually we'll give it to you on the test. So guys, which one is it? Is standard temperature zero degrees Celsius or is standard temperature 273 Kelvin? They're the same temperature. Guys, in the same way that we could have Fahrenheit, like 32 Fahrenheit is zero Celsius, guys, these are the same temperature. But to make sense of this, you need to understand Kelvin. So if you understand this, great. If not, first of all, let me show you how to convert. Just a second. Let me show you how to convert, and then we'll talk about it. And guys, don't write down anything on the next slide. But to convert from Celsius to Kelvin, it's really straightforward. You just add 273 to Celsius, and that gives you Kelvin. Go ahead, Garrett. Good. Yeah, so when do you use Kelvin? And the answer is when you're studying gases. Um, and you'll see why in just a second. Um, but let me answer your question now um, as well as I can. So studying the behavior of gases has to be done in Kelvin because it gives us a common zero point. And let me show you what that means right now. Okay. So guys, don't write any of this down. If you know this, great. If you don't, let me just explain Kelvin to you. So again, don't write this down. So guys, here we have temperature scales. We've got the boiling point of water. We've got the freezing point of water. And we're going to say this is at, at sea level. And then, guys, this thing that you may or may not understand, absolute zero. Do you guys know about absolute zero? What happens at absolute zero? <coughs> Literally nothing. So, guys, the idea is this. Say that this is, I, well, here, let's do ice. This will probably make more sense to you. So, guys, we've got a block of ice, and this is what it looks like inside of an ice crystal. But what are these, mo what are these molecules doing? They're wiggling. They're going like this, right? Can we make them wiggle slower? Yeah, cool it down. And if we cool it down enough, eventually what happens to them? They stop wiggling. Guys, what temperature do they stop wiggling at? Absolute zero. So guys, absolute zero is the temperature at which all motion ceases. Have we ever been to absolute zero? No. How close have we gotten? one ten billionth of a degree Celsius. Ten billionth of a degree Celsius. But guys, we will never get there. In order to get to absolute zero, it requires that you have a refrigerator the size of the universe. And it takes as long to get there as the age of the universe. So guys, it is physically impossible to get to absolute zero, but we've been within one ten billionth of a degree. 
pretty cold. So guys, let's talk about where this is. So boiling point, freezing point, absolute zero. So guys, in the Fahrenheit scale, I think you know water boils at 212 at sea level. You probably know the freezing point of water in Fahrenheit. 32. And then guys, for reference, absolute zero is negative 459 degrees Fahrenheit. So imagine like frozen water and steam, and that's about 180 degrees between them. Guys, it's more than two times colder than that at absolute zero. It's pretty chilly. But guys, now let's do this in Celsius. What's the boiling point of water in Celsius? 100, this one's zero. That makes a whole lot more sense. But then guys, on this scale, absolute zero is 273 degrees below zero. And again, we've been within one ten billionth of a degree, but we'll never get there. Okay, so here's what happened. A guy named Lord Kelvin, as he was studying gases, he suspected that this temperature was down there, but frankly, he got sick of using all these negative numbers to measure cold temperatures. So he came up with a new temperature scale, and here's what he did. He took the same exact scale as the Celsius scale, but he changed the zero point. So guys, the Kelvin scale is the same as the Celsius scale. The only difference is, is zero in Kelvin is absolute zero. So if that's true, what's the freezing point of water in Kelvin? 273, because a Kelvin is a Celsius. This is 273, and what's the boiling point of water? You get the idea? So guys, in this unit, we are always going to use Kelvin temperature. So now, Garrett, let me answer your question. Why do we use Kelvin? So what happens at zero Kelvin? Mo molecules stop, right? Now, what if those molecules are gas molecules? If those molecules are gas molecules, ideal gases, right? This is a deep thought, you ready? So these molecules are now ideal gases. So these molecules themselves don't take up space, zero volume. So as we cool these molecules down, they slow down, and at absolute zero, they stop. They stop moving. They don't stick together, but they do stop moving. And when they stop moving, they cease to exist. Because the volume of these molecules is zero, the only reason they take up space is because they're moving. And when they stop moving, their volume becomes zero because they stop moving and the molecules themselves don't take up space. That's why we use zero Kelvin. And we're going to measure that in lab next week. Go ahead. No, there'd be plenty of everything. It just would, it would appear as if it weren't there, and we'd all be dead because it would be really cold. Yeah. But this is interesting. Do you guys know the average temperature of the universe? If you could take the temperature of everywhere in the universe and take an average, do you guys know what it is? It's actually, let me turn this off so I can touch my board. It's actually 3 Kelvin. The average temperature of the universe is 3 Kelvin. That's pretty chilly. We're glad for this little rock that keeps us alive. So, you guys okay on Celsius and Kelvin and stuff? Okay, so then guys, this. We understand standard temperature, now let's go standard pressure. This one is a huge letdown, you ready? Standard temperature is defined as the pressure at sea level on an average day. I know, right? Seems like you could do better than that. But guys, that is actually the definition of standard pressure. So let me put this in context for you. For those of you that actually take care of your own cars, guys, you keep your tires inflated, right? You put the tire gauge on there, it goes 32. 32 what? PSI, pounds per square inch. So guys, that means for every square inch of tire surface area, there's 32 pounds of pressure pushing out. If you can picture a 35 pound plate in the weight room, that 35 pounds-ish is every square inch on your tire. That's why your tires can lift something as heavy as a car. So guys, you inflate your tires to like 32 PSI. Actually, and you don't need to write this down, is about 14 and a half PSI. So guys, that means right now for every square inch of surface area in your body, you're being crushed by about 15 pounds of force. Now again, we talked, why aren't you being smushed? 
because you leak and it goes up and down and in and out and it pushes in both directions. So, but guys, those are not the units you need to know. You need to know standard pressure in the unit's atmospheres, ATMs. Do any of you have a barometer on your phone? You guys, they're free. Go to the app store, download a barometer, and you'll see that you can actually set, because most of our phones now have little barometers inside of them. It's a little diaphragm that the air pushes on. Guys, you can set your barometer to atmospheres. You can also set it to kilopascals, KPA. And guys, those are the two units that you need to know. Standard pressure is one atmosphere, or it is also 101.3 KPA. So if you're interested, right now, set um, settings, let's go atmospheres. So guys, right now, the pressure here is, wait, how do I go back? Okay, so right now, the pressure here is 0.837 atmospheres. Why is it less than one? Because we're higher, right? We talked about that. Guys, the idea is that is we, we're up here at 40, well, actually, we're at 4,700 feet. And guys, at 4,700 feet, there's less atmosphere on top of this. So atmospheric pressure right now is 0.8369 atmospheres. And we can switch this. What was the other one we do, KPA? Uh, let me switch to KPA. Um, in kilopascals, that number is about 84 kilopascals, about 85, so less than 101.3. So guys, those are the units of pressure that we're going to use. You guys okay? All right. So guys, with that said then, we're actually almost done. So here's what we need to do. We now understand two things. Gases are complicated. We need simpler models, ideal gases. We also now understand that gases are sensitive to temperature and pressure, and so we need standards. But now, guys, we are going to wrap up the day by talking about, OK, then how do gases respond to temperature and pressure? But guys, here's the thing. You already know the answers to this. Ready? Watch my hands. If this is a balloon, what happens to it if we heat it up? It gets bigger, right? Now, what about this? What if we take a balloon and cool it down? It's going to get smaller. Now, guys, what about this? What if I take a balloon and squeeze it? What's going to happen to it? It's going to get smaller. It'll pop, but it'll get smaller, and then it'll pop. So guys, you already understand this stuff. Hotter is bigger. More squeeze is smaller. That's all we're going to talk about, but we're going to give it names. So guys, this stuff is not hard. Don't overthink it. You already understand the principles. The problem is, is 150 years ago, when people started thinking about this stuff, they thought this was pretty cool, and people got to name these ideas after themselves. So guys, the first thing we're going to talk about is called Charles Law. So you ready? Charles Law. What happens to a balloon if you heat it up? Gets bigger. Cool it down? It's Charles Law. Because that's all there is to it. But Charles made it hard. Charles said this. He said, the volume of a gas at constant pressure varies directly with Kelvin temperature. Guys, all that means is you get it hot and it gets bigger. So you can write down the technical definition if you want. But guys, it's really this simple. Temperature goes up, volume goes up. Temperature goes down, volume goes down. Do notice, though, guys, that we're going to be doing our temperature measurements in Kelvin. So that the relationship truly is direct. Because that's all there is to Charles' law. Hotter gets bigger, colder gets smaller. So you ready for some practical stuff? Because this didn't happen as much this year because it wasn't a harsh winter. But let me try this and see if you had this experience. Ready? Charles Law. Did any of you get up one morning to come to class on time? And you looked at your tires and you saw this. So it's January, it's 10 below, you get in your car and it looks like somebody let the air out of your tires. Any of you ever had this experience? Guys, talk to me about what's going on. Because it's not because somebody came and pranked you and let the air out of your tires. What happened? Yeah, it's cold, right? And guys, when the air in your tires gets cold, what do they do? 
it contracts. Does that mean there's less air inside your tires? No, same amount of air. But then you go, okay, I'm gonna be fine because it's just that the air is cold. You get in your car and you drive to school and if you had taken the time to look at your tires again, what would you see by the time you got to school? They're reinflated. Guys, why do they reinflate as you drive to school? Because as your tire rolls, the bottom of your tire is always flexing as it hits the, the asphalt. The bottom of your tire is always flexing. That creates friction and friction creates heat and that heat heats up the cold gas inside your tires and that gas expands and reinflates your tires. So guys, if you get in your car one morning and your tires look flat because it's cold, don't go put more air in them, because then what's going to happen? Then that air will inflate and your tires could pop. So guys, never ever adjust the air pressure on your tires until they're warm. So those pressures, that, anyway, just trust me on that one. You guys know there's a sticker inside your door that, never mind. Okay, so guys, what about this one? If cold gets smaller, what about hot? So why doesn't a hot air balloon blow up? See, guys, because we've got hot, right? And we're dumping heat into this gas that's up inside this balloon. And as we do, what does the gas do? Well, it expands. So why doesn't the balloon explode? Not because it's cold outside. Have any of you been up in a hot air balloon? Because you may not know if you've never been up in one. Do you not know? Do you know? Oh, then let me tell you. Guys, there's actually a trap door in the top of the balloon. Do you guys not know this? There, so the, the, the person that's driving the balloon has got two levers. One fires the burner. The other one opens a huge trap door in the top of the balloon. And so what they'll do is they'll pull on the lever and, and fire right up inside the balloon. But then they pull the other lever and literally this big gaping hole. It's scary because you can look up through the hole like into outer space. It's a little unnerving at first. And they open up this trap door. And what they do then is they, they heat the gas. The gas expands, but they open the trap door. And where does the gas go? Out the top. Then when they shut off the burner, they close the trap door. And the gas that is still inside the balloon is expanded and therefore less dense. And the balloon goes up. See guys, if they didn't have the trap door, they'd heat up the gas and the gas would expand and eventually the balloon would fail. So they need to have that trap door there to let the expanded gas out. Do you get the idea? You guys good on Charles' law? Okay, then guys, let's go the other direction. We understand temperature and pressure, or temperature and volume. Now let's talk Boyle's law. Boyle's law is all about pressure and volume. So Boyle's law says this. The volume of a gas at constant temperature varies inversely with pressure. Increase the squeeze, the balloon gets smaller, and if you let off the squeeze, the balloon gets bigger. So guys, if you like it in arrow form, you're welcome to write it down. Pressure up, volume down, pressure down, volume up. Oh gosh, sorry. My clicker's clicking too quickly. There we go. So guys, let's talk about it. So what happens if you take a bullet? Well, you guys have probably had this experience, not even with balloons. You ever dive to the bottom of the diving tank in a swimming pool? What happens? Your ears hurt, right? Because your head is being squished. Thank goodness your skull is rigid or your head would collapse. Because guys, when you go to the bottom of the pool, the pressure goes up and your head gets squished. Now, what would happen if you were to grab a balloon and swim the balloon to the bottom of the diving tank? The balloon gets smaller. You can actually measure the size. This would be a good science fair project. You can actually measure the size of the balloon as it physically gets smaller because the pressure goes up and the balloon gets squished. So guys, what if we wanted to do the opposite? What if we wanted to decrease the pressure on the balloon? What could we do? Send it into outer space. Guys, grab that balloon and put it on the space shuttle and send it into outer space. What's the pressure in outer space? Zero. What happens to the balloon? 
it blows up. Do you get the idea? So what about this? Guys, do you know what this is? It's a weather balloon. Guys, right now, there are hundreds of these in our upper atmosphere collecting data that we use to make weather forecasts. These things are everywhere. And guys, they launch these things on a daily basis. It's literally, well, it's not a hot air balloon, it's full of helium. But guys, this is a weather balloon ready to be launched. But what do you notice about it? It's not fully inflated. Why not? So what's going to happen when they cut those tethers and let that balloon go? It's going up, right? And as it goes up, it's going higher in our atmosphere. What happens to air pressure as we go higher? The pressure goes down. So what's this balloon going to do? Will it get bigger or smaller? It's going to get bigger. Guys, if they launched these balloons fully inflated, they would get up a couple thousand feet and they would rupture. So they actually launch these balloons like two-thirds inflated. As they rise, the gas expands because the pressure goes down. The balloons expand, and, they get, and when they finally get up to altitude, it's at that point that they're then fully inflated, and they hover there and collect weather data. Guys, that's Boyle's law. If they launch these things fully inflated, it would be game over. Yeah. They don't. Yeah, they, they, so eventually, it's amazing. They'll stay up there for a while, but they fully expect to not only lose the balloon, but all the weather collection information, all the weather instruments as well. Uh, a lot of times they just go down in the ocean and you never see them again. But sometimes you'll actually see them. They'll come down here. Um, some of them are actually now on remote controls and they can actually push a button and it makes them slowly leak and they'll come back down. But a lot of them, they just figure they're gonna lose. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. You guys see where Google was actually trying to pull off a thing where they were going to launch like thousands of weather balloons only with weather, not weather collection instruments. They were gonna put Wi-Fi radios up there and they were gonna create global Wi-Fi by bouncing the Wi-Fi signals off of weather balloons. Did you guys not see that? Yeah, they were, talk about Google taking over the world. But the upside was then you would have a Wi-Fi connection everywhere on the planet. Be kind of cool. Anyway, so guys, you get the idea? Boyle's Law, Charles Law, temperature up, volume up, temperature down, volume down, pressure is the opposite. You okay? Okay. So guys, if you understand this conceptually, we now need to talk about it mathematically. And guys, we're going to solve three problems and call it a day. So join me. So there is a way that we can take these ideas and bring them together mathematically. And guys, the equation is this. Write it down. It'll be given to you on the test. You do not need to memorize it. But guys, you do need to be able to manipulate this equation. Mm -hmm. On the final, you will not be asked to memorize any equations or any constants. Uh, we will give you all of the equations and stuff that you need. Yep. So guys, the equation says this, PIVI divided by TI is equal to um, PF, VF, TF. And I think you probably, so the I is initial and the V is final. So the left-hand side of this describes a sample of gas where it starts, the right-hand side of this where it ends up. And guys, this is Boyle's and Charles' law put together. So there's our volume, pressure is Boyle's law, temperature is Charles' law, and it's all mucked together. And guys, we understand the laws. Temperature goes up, volume goes up, temperature goes down, volume goes down. This describes it mathematically. So what we can do is we can actually say not just, yes, temperature goes up, volume goes up, but if the temperature goes up this much, how much does the volume go up? And that's what we're going to do with this. So guys, if you want to write down samples, you certainly can. We're going to solve this three times, and then you'll have time to work on your first to last homework assignment. So guys, it goes like this says we collect 75 cubic meters of gas. That's like a swimming pool. 
Can you picture a, cube, a meter by a meter by a meter? And then 75 of those. It's like a small swimming pool. So you get 75 cubic meters of gas at 25 degrees Celsius. What will its volume be at 150 Celsius? You had a chance to write it down? What's the answer? Bigger. Do you get bigger? If it starts at 25 and it goes up to 150, we're heating it up. So what's it going to do? It's going to get bigger. So guys, that's the first thing you want to do is make a prediction. What should my answer be? Well, if you start at 25 and go up to 150, it going to get bigger. How much bigger? We'll figure that out. But it's going to get bigger. Bigger than what? Bigger than 75. So that's how we can check our answer. But let's do the math. So guys, write down the equation. And guys, once you have the equation written down, this is going to make your life a whole lot easier. What you've got to do is go back to the problem and find the variables. So 75 cubic meters, pressure, volume, or temperature? Volume. 25 Celsius, pressure, volume, or temperature? Temperature. Guys, what is the pressure given in the problem? There isn't one. Cross it out. Guys, you don't need to know the pressure. It's not changing, so you can cross it out. There's no pressure information given, so we can get rid of it. So now, guys, from there, we just plug in what we know. So what is the volume initially? 75 cubic meters. Now, guys, be careful here. What is the temperature initially? Not 25 Celsius. You got to convert to Kelvin. It's 298. Add 273. Guys, always convert your temperatures to Kelvin. Then, guys, what's the final volume? That's our X. We don't know. And then it sounds like somebody already did the math. What's our final temperature? 450? So 273 plus 150? Four is it a yeah, four twenty-three? Uh oh. All right, so guys, now all we gotta do is solve it. I do not need to see any of your math, but what you're gonna end up doing is multiplying these two together and then dividing by two ninety-eight. And when you do this correctly, the answer is 110 cubic meters. Guys, you don't need to show any of that problem solving, the math. At this point in your academic career, that's a gimme. So 750 times 423 divided by 298. And then guys, notice the units for volume are the same we started with. Yeah. Yep, in just a minute. I'm hoping at least one of you doesn't like my answer. Significant digits, right? So guys, watch, because this is right. Watch. So how many do we have here? Three, three, three. So why do we only get two in the answer? And guys, the answer is because of 25. This temperature, 298, was based on a Celsius temperature of 25, which is only 2. And when you add 298 to convert that to Kelvin, that doesn't give you extra significant digits. So you have to go back to the original problem to limit your significant digits. Make sure you're doing that. You guys OK? Can we go to the next one? OK. So now, guys, this. 325 milliliters of gas at standard temperature and pressure you know what, I'm going to, eh, I'm going to change this. Let me do this. Let's do it this way. 
So 325 milliliters of gas at 101.3 kPa. That is standard pressure, but I thought I'd give it to you. So you get 325 milliliters of gas at 101.3 kPa. What is the volume at 167 kPa? So guys, what's the answer? Bigger or smaller? Bigger or smaller? Well, let's look. Temperature starts at 101. Temperature goes up, or I'm sorry, pre sorry. Pressure starts at 101. Pressure goes up to 167. So if pressure goes up, volume goes down. It's going to get smaller. Smaller than what? Smaller than 325. So guys, our answer should be smaller than 325. Let's find out how much smaller. So we've got our equation. Tyler, don't forget to talk to me before you go. So we got our equation. And guys, let's look. 325 is the volume. 101.3 is the pressure. Guys, what's the temperature? It's not given. Cross it out. Now, guys, we just plug in our numbers. Our initial pressure is 101.3 kPa. Our initial volume is 325 milliliters. Our final pressure is 167. Our final volume is x. I'm thinking you can probably see how to solve that for x. And when you've done it properly, the answer is 197 milliliters. Sure enough, it's smaller than 325. It worked. So guys, we're going to solve one more, and then uh, you'll have a few minutes to work on homework. So guys, to solve this, you multiply these two together and divide by that. And guys, you know this trick, right? If you ever get into a math problem and if you can't solve it, make yourself a simpler problem. For example, if you can't solve this because the numbers are ugly, I wonder if you can solve this. 4 times 3 is equal to 2x. Can you solve that? Sure. 3 times 4 is 12. 12 divided by 2 is 6. Guys, if you can solve this, you can solve this, because it's the same problem, just bigger numbers. Multiply and then divide, multiply and then divide. Do they teach you that trick? There you go. All right, so guys, one more and we're done. I'm going to encourage you not to write this question down, but let's solve it. So guys, it says this, a gas occupies three liters at 150 kPa and 410 Celsius, what does the volume become at STP? So let's solve it. So guys, again, let's not write it down. Let's just solve it. So we've got three liters of gas. We know it's pressure. We know it's temperature. So guys, which one can we cross out? Neither. We've got them all. So guys, our initial pressure is 150 kPa. Our initial volume is 3 liters, and our initial temperature is not 410. Remember to add 273, it's 683. Then, guys, we want to know the volume at standard temperature and pressure. And again, guys, you don't have to memorize this. We'll give it to you. Standard pressure is 101. Come on, 101.3 kPa. The volume is our X. Standard temperature is 273. Well, hello, Miss Shaw. Guess what day it is? What day is it? Oh, uh, 
You missed it. I missed it. Val just came and did the hump day. Oh. I know, it's the best. <laughs> so guys, how do we solve this then? This is what I do. I do this math first, 150 times 30 divided by 683. Then I do this math, the 101 divided by 273. And then whatever this is divided by whatever this is. And you know you got it right if you get 1.8. So guys, you've got the homework assignment in front of you. We will grade this on Friday. We will, you're not about to ask me for the homework, are you? OK. Oh, please, yeah. Oh, these numbers? So these numbers, Fred, are the values for standard temperature and pressure. So standard temperature is 273. Standard pressure is this. And um, those are given to you. Okay. So, and I'll get you the homework in a second. So guys, you've got the um, homework in front of you, or if you don't, it's because you were late and I'll get it to you. Um, guys, we'll grade this on Friday. We will watch, and I think given what we just talked about, you're gonna find this especially interesting, a video that's all about super cold systems in absolute zero. It's kind of fascinating. Um, and then guys, we'll do a lab on this on Tuesday. That is all.